Now, there's been a new twist in the Chinese spy balloon saga with President Biden fronting media to clear the air on the flying objects. We don't yet know exactly what these three objects were, but nothing, nothing right now suggests they were related to China's spy balloon program. The intelligence community's current assessment is that these three objects were most likely balloons tied to private companies, recreation or research institutions studying weather or conducting other scientific research. So the $400,000 missile may have shot down a $12 balloon belonging to our hobby club. Good to know. Joining us now is president at the centre of the American experiment, John Heinderaker. John, thank you so much for joining us. Um, president Biden, he doesn't exactly exude strength and competence, does he? I mean, what would the Chinese Communist Party be thinking watching his performance over this issue? You know, Rita, it's absolutely unbelievable. Here's this big balloon. By the way, it was described as being the size of three big yellow school buses, right? <laughs> <laughs> With all kinds of spy equipment dangling from it. And they waited eight days and they let the balloon go all the way across the United States, complete its mission, and then get over the Atlantic, and then they shot it down. They took so much grief for that that they then started shooting down everything in sight. And these innocent little hobby balloons, they'd blow out of the sky, as you say, Rita, with the $400,000 missiles. There's a club in, in Northern Illinois called the Northern Illinois Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade, and they reported that one of their toy balloons disappeared over <laughs> Yukon Territory in Canada right at the time when the U.S. Air Force reportedly oh, no. shot a balloon <laughs> in that very location. And so... Somehow they have they have just become a laughing stock and nobody can really figure out what they were thinking about that Chinese spy balloon. Now, John, I want to move on to another issue, which we've been hearing a lot about in Australia. I've been reading a lot about, and that is this horrific train derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Now, I know that Ilan Omar was very uh, interested in, in this until she found out East Palestine was in the United States. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, there is this whole question about this huge toxic chemical spill, which is very, very serious. Talk that this entire town may be contaminated. The footage you see of this fire is terrifying. The rivers all seem to be um, green. The livestock around the place is dying. And yet officials seem to be saying, oh, look, this is probably no big deal. Go back. Now, a lot of people are very suspicious because, of course, you know, the same people that said put on a mask to avoid a respiratory virus and get rid of your gas cooktop to save the planet are now saying, well, I was being trained full of, you know, the most insanely toxic chemicals on Earth dumped into your local river and wells. No big deal. <laughs> what is going on with this? And are people are pretty right to be pretty cynical about this, aren't they, John? James, it's really hard to understand. You know, for, for two weeks after this train derailment, people are reporting pets dying and and so forth. And the Biden administration did absolutely nothing, said it was not a federal matter, didn't provide any assistance. Now, two weeks later, they've changed their minds. And now FEMA, the emergency agency, is, is stepping in and starting to, to, to do some things. But the one thing the Biden administration did do in those first two weeks was try to blame Donald Trump Trump for the train derailment. And, you know, the feckless Pete Buttigieg, the Secretary of Transportation, who appears to be shocked to learn that his, his cabinet position actually has some duties attached to it. He, he apparently didn't plan on doing well, anything when he took that job. And he put, he put out a tweet saying that, well, you know, the problem is that in 2018, the Trump administration withdrew a pending rule that had something to do with train breaks and so we're really handcuffed but, here in the in the Biden administration. Well, it turned out that, that that pending rule would not have applied to this train in any event. But it, it goes to show how kind of pitiful this administration is that after more than two years in office, when something goes wrong, their first instinct is to look backward and somehow try to blame it on Donald Trump. But I mean, John, Pete Buttigieg has presided over trans transportation disaster after transportation disaster. The same time this train crash was playing out, he was saying that there needed to be, you know, fewer white construction workers uh, on roads projects. Um, you know, the air system shut down for a day and a half in the United States because he decided that notice to air men 
was not inclusive and he changed the system so it was noticed to air missions. How does Pete Buttigieg still get away with having a job? Why does the press let him get away with having a job? You know, some people are saying, James, that Pete Buttigieg is doing such a terrible job that for the first time in, in 50 years, Americans actually know the name of the Secretary of Transportation. <laughs> <laughs> Normally, you do not get famous in that, in that job, but it shows the priorities of this administration and, frankly, of the American left. You know, they're not interested in doing the basic jobs of government. They're interested mm. in trying to organize our society, attack white people, uh, you know, drive woke ideology everywhere they can. And they're really not very interested in things like protecting national security, protecting national well-being with regard to things like chemical spills or, or whatever it may be. John, I wanted to ask you, still staying on Pete Buttigieg, when he was appointed Transportation Secretary, uh, Joe Biden made a big deal about the fact that they would have a gay man in this position, and Pete's own claim to uh, holding that spot was that he's always loved trains. Uh, <laughs> are people getting frustrated in the US with this seeming uh, strategy of the Biden administration on appointing people because they tick a diversity box rather than because they're actually competent? Because that's what it looks like from over here. Well, James, everyone I know is disgusted with it. Uh, you know, what I can't understand is Joe Biden still rates about 40% approval in the, in the polls. And I always ask myself, who are those 40%? <laughs> <laughs> You know, what are they smoking? What, what news are they paying attention to? I, I can't really explain it, but no, you're right. I mean, this is the kind of thing we're talking about. They care about checking the diversity boxes, but they don't actually care about getting the job done. Well, talking about checking diversity boxes, we're hearing the University of South Florida is, in the interest of diversity, bringing back segregation. This is very, very, very progressive indeed. Well, Rita, we're seeing this all across the United States. Segregation today, segregation to, uh, tomorrow, segregation forever. That's what George Wallace said in the 1950s and 60s. It's what the Democratic Party is, is saying today. And this came to light because Governor Ron DeSantis of Florida issued an order requiring the public uh, universities and colleges in Florida to itemize their diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and initiatives and reveal how much money they're spending on them. Well, you know, they didn't want to do that. And so one of the things that happened is that the universities of South Florida deleted a bunch of stuff that it had online about its anti-racism uh, programs. And, uh, but, they, but it came to light anyway. Somebody, somebody had them and, and turned them over to Chris Roof who's a, a terrific activist, then it turns out they were having segregated sessions where they would mm. teach you know, what, how to be black, you know, how to walk them through the various stages where they start out thinking it's not that big a deal, and then they learn that it's the only important thing in life. And then you separately, you, you teach the white students about white guilt and white fragility and why they should feel bad about being white. And, and you take them through these various stages and they come out imbued with this left-wing uh, racialist ideology. It's really sinister stuff. And I think it's revealing that when the governor of their state, on behalf of the taxpayers and the citizens, wanted to know, what are you teaching now about diversity, equity, and inclusion, they deleted it. Well, John, I mean, it's not just, you know, Florida State and the university there. It's also the State Department. And, you know, mm. you talk about what white people need to learn or what they want to teach white people. Uh, according to the U.S. Consul Karen Decker to Afghanistan, now, of course, America doesn't have an embassy in Afghanistan physically anymore. It's just a sort of a <laughs> outbuilding in Doha. Um, apparently, Afghans need a bit of black girl magic. W what is this? Tell me about this here. <laughs> This is so bizarre. State Department official Karen Decker, uh, who is attached to the Afghanistan embassy, only it's not in Afghanistan because that's too dangerous. As you say, it's in Doha. She put out a tweet that said, Afghan girls need a movement like hashtag black girl magic. Liberals <laughs> love hashtags. I don't know why that is. Apparently, black girl magic is some kind of a fashion thing with some podcasts. I don't know. She tagged Beyonce. And, and I don't think so. What <laughs> made of it if she found out about the tag. And, and the idea that women in Afghanistan who are not even permitted to attend school 
uh, you know, in an environment that's so dangerous that this Karen Decker, she's not there, right? She's actually in a different, in a different country, and she's talking about let let's bring black girl magic uh, to Afghanistan. I mean, the cluelessness is just beyond belief. John, I wanted to ask you about something Rita was talking about earlier in the show. She was showing clips of Joe Biden and his fabulous communication style. <laughs> the, the White House spokesperson recently said that Joe Biden is the greatest communicator in the White House. Are, are we missing something that you guys are seeing over there? <laughs> well, if, if you've uh, seen his spokesman, you might say she could be right. <laughs> 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 if, if, they're, if they're the two, if they and Kamala are the three competitors for that title, I don't know it. It could be close. Look, I mean, these people are whistling in the graveyard. It is obvious to everybody that Joe Biden is not fully functional. He, he's not just elderly. You know, he's in some some stage of dementia, whether it's early or late. And he doesn't make many public appearances. He, he doesn't talk to the press. Uh, he, he does his best. He struggles to read a teleprompter. His condition is really obvious to everybody. And yet the problem the Democrats have is that they don't really have anybody else. And when they did reasonably well in the midterm elections last November, it became very hard for them to, to explain why they're easing Joe Biden out the door as long as he can still stand up. And so it's really <laughs> hard to say where it's going to go from here. Well, who, who are his, say, top two challengers? Is it the California governor who's really going to vie for that nomination? Well, it's, it, you know, people used to talk about Pete Buttigieg as <laughs> Oh, jeez. I lied after Kamala Harris. No one's saying that anymore. I think you're right, Rita. I think Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, is the guy people talk about. The irony there is that California is a failed state. People are fleeing California mm. as fast as blue balls can carry them. California is, is just doing horribly in, in every respect. And, and so I would love to see an election where Gavin Newsom runs on his record as governor of California and Ron DeSantis runs on his record as governor of Florida. That would be a great contest to see. John Heinderaker, always fabulous getting your insights. Thank you so much for joining us this morning.